All right, saints, open up to the book of Luke, chapter 10. Uh, last Sunday uh, was part four on the good eye versus the evil eye. That uh, You guys are really enjoying this series. And so I'm going to uh, kind of spring from that. I'm not going to say that that's the, the, the title of the message. It could be we could make it a part five. But it's going to be a, like a little springboard from the last four sessions that you've listened to. So when you're in the book of Luke, I'm going to use the English Standard, standard Version. Just say, I'm there. All right, so somebody forgot the Bible. I told you, cruise captain's watching. <laughs> no. <laughs> I really didn't look up to see you. So Luke chapter 10. I want to, to jump into this particular area, and it says this in verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? Of course, the law is going to be instructions. What's written in the instructions? What's written in the Torah? What's written in the law? What's written in the instruction? How do you read it? How do you inter interpret it? How do you understand it? Is what Jesus is asking. So in verse 27, this is how he answered. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, with uh, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said unto him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. So in this, in this particular area of scripture, let me read it for you again in verse 26, um, 27. And he answered, and you shall love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, and then you shall love your neighbor as your Self. We always call it the golden rule. One scripture says all, of the, all the, Jesus is talking about all the law of the prophets hang on these, on these two particular areas. So right now, if you want to, you can even just kind of mark your Bibles, put your Bibles away a little bit and let me talk to you. I got a couple of scripture references I'll give you in a few moments, but I just want a listening ear. Remember, we're on a cruise this morning and you didn't pay for this cruise. <laughs> So, <laughs> cruise, but on cruise you can have a, a buffet. So let's have a buffet of God's word, and kind of break this down with what we've heard over the last the last four weeks. We really had a lot of detailed information, and so I want to bring this in not under the law, not under the legalism, but this, the principles remain the same. The principle still remains the same even after the cross. This is something we should do. We should love the Lord thy God with all of our heart. Now we have, a, we have a whole lot of assistance and a whole lot of help because according to the New Testament, when you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the love of God is shed abroad upon your heart. So you have help. You have a helper. You have, you have the help of the Holy Ghost. And I want to tell you that is one of the most exciting things because they didn't have that kind of help. The guy answering this question didn't have that kind of help. He had to do this all by works, if you will, by the mechanism of motions, of good deeds, and, and purposely doing things. It wasn't out of the goodness of the heart. It was out of the command. So with us, it's a little bit different because we have this powerful new covenant, this New Testament, where God takes his instructions and he writes them on our heart, the Bible says. It's a new covenant. So he writes it upon our heart and it says and upon our mind. And you've learned that that's also including your soul. You'll remember last week I talked about it with Adam. When Adam, when he created Adam out of the dust of the earth, he had a physical body. It was, it was perfect. It was flawless. The DNA was perfect. There was no sickness. There was no disease. But it was lifeless. There was no life in it. So this uh, creation, if you will, that was created called man, Adam, man, man there's no life in him. He's not living. So God takes and he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. And if you remember when I said this, I said this is the most amazing because here God is omnipresent. God is everywhere, but God took something from the inside of himself because if he breathed, it came from inside of God and came out of God and entered into Adam. 
So if he breathed the breath of life, so the inside, something inside God, the breath in Hebrew, the ruah, the breath of God, the ruah hakadesh, which would be the Holy Spirit, holy, kadosh, holy. So it breathed into Adam, and now Adam has life because now there's a spirit in him. This is what it says. Now, that, now, now he's, he has life in him. But then it says, and he became a living soul, a living soul. The soul is the intellectual part of decision making. The soul is where you decide. The soul is very important because, yes, it's your thought life. It's the way you think. And that's why, according to Romans, we have to be transformed by renewing our minds to the Word of God. We have the mind of Christ now. We have an anointed one, His anointing, the Holy Spirit, to help us. If the Holy Spirit is guiding us, He teaches us the difference to discern between good and evil, right and wrong. So you had Adam and you have Eve, even, uh, perfect, but this soul still had a decision. Now, Eve was deceived when she partook of the forbidden fruit. She was deceived. Adam wasn't deceived. Adam hearkened and did, and uh, he, he listened to what she had to say, and he partook, but his eyes was wide open. But the wages of sin was death. It brought in destruction into their life. The point that I'm giving to you isn't about the curse or the destruction. The point that I'm giving to you is the awareness of your soul. That's why the New Testament tells you to possess you your soul. Or one of the uh, epistles is very clear on, above all, above all, I wish that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. See, your soul is very important because once you begin to be born again, so you go from being what we would consider still a spirit, but a dead spirit, not alive to Christ or alive to God, an unbeliever. Once you get born again, born again, born anew, then you become a new creation, something that's never been created before. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Now that you've become a new creation in Christ Jesus, it says all things pass away, all things become, not is, becomes new. So you need to understand that the, these precepts and concepts and perception that my spirit is perfect and the Holy Spirit is dwelling in my spirit is perfect. God is dwelling in me. Know ye not, ye are the temple of the Holy Spirit or the temple of God. So God is dwelling in you, and therefore you have to, to try to rightly divide, and you can, according to Hebrews, uh, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the difference between the soul, spirit, marrow, bone, means the body. So the word of God has the ability to cut through all three of you, spirit, soul, mind, and body. So you're processing uh, this very area of love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And you've learned that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And you've already learned in this series that that is not a blood pump. If a person gets a heart transplant, they don't get the thoughts of the donor. So when we say heart, we have to understand Hebraically in the Bible, what that really means is your thoughts. And you want to be consciously aware of where you're thinking. What are you thinking about? Most people are not as conscious about rightly discerning on what should they be thinking. Because if I've got to love my neighbor as myself, then I need to know how to pray for my neighbor. Right? Well, the best way to pray for your neighbor is to pray the word of God over your neighbor. See, that's why when you, you're listening to this series about having a good eye or an evil eye. So I'm learning to bless and not curse. I got to look for what's good. I have to, I got to make sure my eyes, when I look upon something, I have to try my best, my utmost to find the positive in it, the good that's in it. Whatsoever thoughts, pure, just, praiseworthy of good report, think. So, 
I, I, I cannot allow my mind, I have to rein it in. I have to take control, take every thought captive to the obedience of God, to the knowledge of God's word. I have to do that. God's not going to do that for me. I got to do that. I have to make a quality decision that I'm going to think God's way. Now, so if I'm going to think God's way, I'm just using me as an example of a way of preaching. I'm not talking about myself. I'm just preaching. If I'm going to think God's way, then when I look at you personally and I see something in your life that shouldn't be there, what must I do? I must think about that God says he's going to complete the work that he begun in you. See? A perfect work. He's begun a work in you and he's going to continue to work on you. So rather for me to focus on your flaws or your failures, I can be positive in my prayer and say, God, you're still working on them. You're still talking to them. You're working on them. They are your son. They are your daughter. They believe in you. They trust in you. They may be acting the fool. They may be cutting up. They may be, act, may, may be acting crazy. But that's your son. That's your daughter. And so, therefore, I don't want an evil eye or an unclean eye. I don't want to think negative about that person. I have to choose to find a quality of positive. And if you say, well, there's nothing positive in that individual, you're not hearing what I'm saying. No, I can go to the positivity of God's word, and therefore I can pray. How else am I going to pray for my enemies if I don't pray the word of the living God? I've got to find in the word something where I can say and pray over them and pray over my enemy and say, God, open their eyes. Let them rightly discern. Give them understanding. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Because, see, the Holy Spirit can bring conviction. So rather than for me to be praying, oh, God, you need to convict them for their attitude and their actions. No, I, see, I can pray the word of God. Fill them with the Holy Ghost. Get them baptized in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will correct them between right and wrong. And therefore, in the soulless realm, they'll be able to discern whether their actions are correct or whether their actions are wrong. The Holy Spirit can do a whole lot better job than you or I can do in our enemies' lives. God can get in them, get into their heart, and get into their mind, and open up their eyes. So you see, saints, it's very, you've already read the scriptures, and you already have them the, uh, over the last, the last few sessions. But remember, Jesus said it, because he said, if, if your eye is evil, it plunges the whole body into what? Darkness. It plunges the whole body into darkness. But if your eye is full of light, full of seeing pleasantries and, and looking at things that are, are beautiful and things that are pleasant, it causes health. It brings sunshine into the soul. It refreshes you, even brings uh, rejoicing and joy. And of course, joy, the Bible says, a merry heart, a merry heart doeth good like what? Medicine. And we've already learned that the heart isn't this right here. The heart is your thought life. A, a happy thought life, a happy thought life brings health to your body. A toxic thought life, always looking for the critical, always looking for the negative, always looking for the speck in somebody else's eye, is going to cause you to be plunged into darkness. So you want to focus on making sure that your soul, that you are possessing, taking control of your soul. You remember this. This was one of the powerful things that I, when I went back and I watched it, and I said that is so powerful under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, of how I said this. I said that about uh, take up your cross. And I remember it because I said it so bold. I said, not, uh, Jesus, Jesus, not, not, not take up Jesus' cross. I was standing like right here. And I said, not taking up Jesus' cross. He took up his. I can't take up his cross. I don't have to carry his load. He carried that load. He had his own mission. He had, he had his own calling. So I can't take up his. But, however, I can take up my cross. And so how do I do that? And I, sh and I showed you how him in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, 
to the Heavenly Father that if this cup can pass, if there's any other way, if this cup can pass, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. See, that's the soul. Not, not, not my will, but thy will be done. I, I don't want to do what I want to do. I want to do what you want me to do. And you want me to walk in love. You don't want me hating and you don't want me cussing and cursing people. And you don't want me to uh, think ugly thoughts about people. So therefore, then, you, you, then I got to deny myself. I got to take up my cross, deny myself, crucify my flesh. That's why the Bible talks about I die daily. I don't, I don't, I don't believe in it trying to, I don't believe in escapism. I don't believe in trying to escape from these things, saints, because the soul has to always be possessed. You have to possess, meaning to take control of your soulish nature. The Bible talks about it. Even the disciples and the apostles are very clear that they can run the race, but they had to run it lawfully if they want to win the prize. They even talk about being shipwrecked if they're not careful, like others were shipwrecked. There was others that was, that, that was living the life right and then walking away from the things that they were called to. Why? Because it's, it, you can gain the whole world, but lose your own soul. So you can gain the whole world, meaning you can gain a lot of the whole world. When the Bible says, come out and be ye separate, saith the Lord, you could gain the whole world, but you don't really, really what it is, is the world gains you. The world gains you. When you try to possess, remember, the, remember the eye, the evil eye is a greedy eye and it can never be satisfied. You read the verse that's in another, uh, in the series and all three of the other packages there. So the eye of a man is, uh, if it's not trained and tamed, is always greedy. It can never be satisfied. So this is what you have to understand. Therefore, you've got to know how to deny yourself crucify your flesh because you can walk with God and you have seen this. I don't even need to say it. you've seen it take place if you've been in the church for enough years where someone is living for God, on fire for God, rejoicing about the things of God, excited about the house of God, excited about the people of God, excited about the assembling the, uh, together with the believers, excited, 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 excited. And then they become not lukewarm, but they become extremely cold and no longer even attend anywhere, anyhow. They don't watch it. They don't read it. They don't walk it out. And what happens is, is then their soul starts gaining the things of this life and this world. What happened? Well, let's just be honest. Their treasure changed. Because wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So their treasure changed to the house, their treasure changed to this, their treasure changed to the job, their treasure changed to growing the business. Their treasure started changing to worldly things. And that ought not be so. Because as Christians, we already know if we seek the kingdom of heaven first, right? His righteousness and seeking the kingdom of heaven first, we already know all these things are going to be added to us. So we don't have to seek things. Things are already seeking us. So we stay in divine alignment that we're looking for the things of God. We're laying up our treasures in heaven. And with our treasures laid up in heaven, therefore our heart's going to be up there in heavenly places, meaning our thought life. We're thinking more on an eternal level, an eternal plane, if you will, an eternal realm, if you will. We're thinking about eternity. Other people are, are focusing on just things right now. What is one of the oldest sayings that I say all the time is this too shall? Pass. Yeah, this too shall pass. And it is so biblical in, in my spirit to say it that way because it's true. It's just this too is going to pass. It's all going to pass. But when it's all said and done, when everything is said and done, are we going to hear well done, good and faithful servant? Not just enter in, but well done. Well done comes from being able to crucify the flesh. It's being able to be loving with unlovable person. It's being gracious when somebody's not being kind to you. Love is kind. Love is not boastful and proud. Love is kind. It's gentle. Love is never self-seeking. Love is not after for itself. 
Not, not the God kind of agape, the God kind of love. The God kind of love is seeking for others, for others for health, for others for healing, for others for deliverance. Because you gotta, you got to remember, saints, whatsoever man soweth, what happens? That shall he reap. So the more I pray for your health and the more I pray for your healing, it's a reciprocal law. It's a spiritual law. So if I'm praying for God to bless you abundantly and that God give you more than you expected for, then automatically as I sow, so shall I reap. So my prayers is for your best. My prayers is for the good to happen in your life. So automatically it begins to reciprocate back into my life. God's not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So if I talk good about you and not talk about the ugly things about you, then therefore good's going to come back my way. That's, that's that good eye. But that takes training. Some people have never, never even heard a sermon on, on how that you need to possess your soul. You need to take control of your thought life. Many have, but a lot of them haven't. They haven't. They've never been taught that. They get a nice little, they get usually what it is, is an opening, uh, it's almost like a monologue. I mean, they just open up with a, with a joke first. And I'm not picking on Joel. I like to listen to him on, on, on the radio. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's, that's very common. There's a very common in ministries all over. You just some of them aren't on TV. First of all, they open up with a joke. Then they give you a cute little sermon with three points in a poem. Sometimes you get the poem, sometimes you don't. And then, and then, and then you leave. But you, then you wonder why 20 years passes, and some of you are far too young, so you're not even there yet, but you wonder why 20 years passes and yet you're not better, you're not, you haven't grown any. You're like, this just doesn't seem right. How could I go to church for that many years and then not actually produce and not actually grow any further? Because it is a process. L let, me, let me give you a point uh, that you need to always try to remember, if you can, if you can remember, because I know you've heard lots of messages and lots of sermons, and it's hard to retain all of them. I, I do understand that myself. But let me give you one of the main things that God works on in your life. I'm talking about you personally, not through you for others, but on you personally. It does affect others because you've got to love your neighbors as yourself. One of the number one things, one of the number one things that God is dealing with in your life is always your character. That's one of the number one things is he's dealing with your character. It is one of the number one things. He's dealing with your character. He's dealing with your character. All the time, he's dealing with your character. He's dealing with your character. He will set up things that you'll think the devil did it. You will think, oh, sure, sure, sure as the sun rises in the morning, that has got to be the footsteps of the devil that walked in my door. Sure, to bring those kind of problems my way, that has got to be, because it cannot be God. Let me, let me remind you, God knows how to make some things, you know, we could go to an area where God spoke to, uh, to Jonah, and we could, we could use him as a good an example that God will work on your character. Because when Jonah wanted to run because he didn't want to do, deny himself, not my will, but thy will be done. Jonah wants to do his own thing. I'm not going to go to Nineveh. I'm not going to go down there and preach the repentance to those people. I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to go on cruise. <laughs> just, <laughs> I'm just going to go on a cruise. I'm not going to go down there and preach to them. I'll go on a cruise. So he jumps in, on a ship, but when he gets on the ship, everybody that's on the ship is in trouble because of Jonah. And, and sometimes, and sometimes, saints, I, I know we want to deny it. I know we want to deny it. Sometimes you got a lot of storms going on under the roof of your house, and it has nothing to do with anybody under the roof of your house but you. You jump ship. Instead of, instead of obeying and just doing what you don't want to do that God's telling you to do, uh, you, you just bail out on God. And God begins to rock the boat and begins to cause the storms to begin to, to rise up. People are praying. Let me tell you something. This is a little side note. Um, Chris Mitchell, uh, he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful gentleman. He works for CBN in Jerusalem. He gave me a private tour of, of, uh, 
of CBN, Christian Broadcasting Network, you know, Pat Robertson and all that. He gave me the tour of, of the entire studio and stuff. We, we've exchanged uh, phone numbers and he was at Rabbi Zadok's um, uh, birthday, 70th birthday when I was in Israel. That's when we met. So anyhow, so Chris Mitchell, I seen this morning, he said that in Iran, right now, they're having a revival of Muslims coming to Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. But they've also had like three, three um, one nuclear place was attacked with a bomb. They don't know who done it yet. They haven't been able to figure it out. Uh, when there were nuclear reactors where they were trying to create. So they've had all this, they have, they have, they have I, I don't, there is such a, a storm going on in Iran right now, such a storm, physically and spiritually. And in the midst of this chaos, people are, are getting, uh, th this is what Chris says, Chris, Chris Mitchell and those that was interviewed, they just said they're, t they're tired of it. They don't want Islam no longer. They don't want to be Muslim no longer. They want, they want to be Christians. They want to come to Christ. They said that the Christians treat you better. Christians have a good heart. Christians are good people. And then you have them that are here in the United States. They were on there also being interviewed and stuff uh, that was from Turkey and things like that. And, was, he, and the guy says, he says, the Christians are just wonderful people. And uh, he's not converted yet, this particular guy. But I'm just telling you, in the middle of a storm, characters get tested. Yeah. In the middle of a chaos, characters get tested. And what we've been going through, whatever they call it, pandemic, epidemic, I don't know. <laughs> they got so many names for it. But one, one thing I know, I, one thing I do know, your character is showing in the midst of this. Your character is showing. I mean, your character is just like beaming on whether you know how to walk in peace in yourself peace, you know, like we say, peace that passes all understanding, how you can walk in peace in God, and then how you make sure that you're not judging and criticizing everybody else. Now, you guys, we have to do this. We're Christians. We can't have that fighting that we hear that's going on, or at least I hear it. I haven't seen it yet. They call it mask shaming is what they call it, but I haven't seen it yet. But from what I'm hearing, there's fights breaking out out there. If you, if, you, if you have a mask on, they come against you. If you don't have a mask on, they come against you. It's like they're fighting. What? Their character is starting to rise to the surface. And God's trying us like a fiery furnace, if you will. He's purifying us. He's bringing up the silver and the gold, if you will, like a refiner's fire. That's what the Bible says. And it's like the body don't even know they're in the refining fire. They just want to blame it all on the devil and stuff. And, and God didn't bring it, but God can always work what the enemy intended for evil. God can work to the good. So right now he's trying to work it to the good in our lives. He's trying to refine you. He's trying to refine you in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the storm. To see, do you got an ugly eye every time you see somebody that don't look like you, they don't wear what you're wearing, they don't have this on, they don't have that on. So you automatically, because your eyes are talking to you. So when you see them without a mask, your eyes are saying nasty stuff to your brain, which is dropping into your heart, which is plunging you into darkness. And then the darkness gets so deep, Jesus says that when you think you have light and you don't even have light, it's so dark. You think you got light and you don't. It's happening to people. It's happening to people. Maybe not to you, maybe not to me, but it is happening to people. A vicious attack. And, so, and it's like, rise up above it. Rise up above it. Rise up above it. It's, it's, you, do you remember, and some of you are way too young for this, but we had a WWJD. What would Jesus do, right? We had a what, what would Jesus do movement. I mean, yes, we had wristbands. We had them everything. We had them on rings. We had them on necklaces. We had them on shirt. Is what would Jesus do? Yes. What would Jesus do? Not you. So get out your house, get, out your, get off your computer, go to the hospital, and heal them. If you're going to tell me this is what Jesus would do, I'm not Jesus. 
I'm, I'm glad you think that much of me. I'm not him. I represent him, but I'm not him. Now, I had a dream the other night that, I, that literally two nights ago, I had a dream I was walking on water. It was, it was just crazy. I was just walking, and I literally was walking on water. I, but I'm not going to go try it. <laughs> uh, first of all, Peter had to ask permission. And Jesus said, come. Now, if I go home, and I walk out by my swimming pool, and Jesus appears on the other side, steps out in the middle of the deep end, and says, come, I'm going to go out there and walk on the water. Okay? But until he says, do it, I'm not going to do it. I am not him. I am his representative. <laughs> Meaning, number one, I can not heal you. I'm not your healer. I can be a believer that lays hands on the sick and believe for him to heal you. But when you get the healing, I can't take no credit for it. There's no stripe on my back that paid for it. So I've got to keep that main focus. And my character has to remain on the, on the Lord. And I got to make sure that I give him glory and credit. For what he does in me and he does through me. I got to stay humble. You know, you learn this. God resists the proud. When you get prideful and you get haughty, you fill yourself with such darkness that you think you're being super righteous and super, uh, you know, religious and super Christian and all that. And no, you're being super crazy. It's just super crazy. You've got to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. You've got to humble yourself under him and realize I cannot do nothing but through him and by him. And the works that I do is the father that does the works in me and through me. So I don't take credit for none of it. None of it. You give God all the glory and you give God all the credit. Go to Hebrews chapter four. Your character, don't forget that. Your character is what God is working on. You, we're so quick to try to work on everybody around us, but we need to work on ourselves, amen? We, we really do. We need to work on ourselves. If, if you can get peace with yourself, you'll get peace with those that are around you. But if you're trying to make everybody get, get if you're trying to force other people to bring the peace to you, you're going to be waiting a very long time. Like we used to say around my house, that dog won't hunt. So if you're waiting for someone else to bring it, you're going to be waiting a very long time. But when you learn how to get that peace within yourself, then you can allow that peace to flow out of you, and it will have an effect on the people around you. Or at least it won't affect you on what they do around you. So Hebrews 4 and 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Least any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even a dividing asunder of what? Soul, spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner, a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. The inner thought life. You have to do it on purpose. You've got to think of, I love the Lord thy God with all my heart, means my, my thinking, my thought life, with all my mind, with all my thought processes. I think on them. But also, I've got to love the Lord thy God with all my strength. That means my physical body too, right? The temple of the Holy Spirit, the physical body. If you've got a calling on your life, then it takes, a, there's certain prerequisites that you've got to do to maintain your physical body in order to fulfill your purpose. Is that okay to say it that way? For if you're going to fulfill your purpose, you might have to have more physical strength to fulfill your purpose. One gentleman many, many years ago back in Fort Pierce at Sunrise Tabernacle was a traveling evangelist. And, um, and I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. He's a wonderful traveling evangelist. Totally was not fit in any way, shape, or form. Nothing against him there. But the problem is that this is exactly what happened. After he preached, and this is at Tommy York, Pastor Tommy York's church, still there today, Sunrise Tabernacle, still there today. 
still ministering there today. But that traveling evangelist, after he preached, got down and was walking back and forth, sweating, wiping the sweat off. And now it was time for the altar call. Now, he's a traveling evangelist. Now, you, you do recall, some of you do recall that in many times, not saying that particular church, but in many churches, God only shows up when they, when they bring someone in. Yeah. Okay? Some, yeah, some, of them, some of them, that's the way it is. You, that's, they call it a revival. They don't have healing teams. They don't have prophetic teams. They don't have deliverance teams like this ministry does. They don't have no, nobody operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's not happening there. So they have to bring someone in that is willing to move in the gift of prophecy or move in the gift of healing, okay? And I'm not saying that was their, their situation. But here's what happened. When it came time for the altar call and it came time to move in the gifts of God, he moved just a tiny bit and sat down on the bench which would have been an altar. He sat down on the bench and he says, whew, whew, whew. I feel like that, I feel like, I feel like, I feel like God said, that's it for tonight. I think, mm -mm. that's not it. That's not it. You just can't get up. You can't walk any further. You so wore out, out of breath, out of shape. You're so physically unfit that you can't even spend 15 minutes in this altar. It was obvious, saints. Now, I can't judge him, and I'm not judging him, but I do discern the matter of what it was. Judge means to condemn him. I do not look upon him in an unfavorable way. I see what happened, and people did not receive ministry because he was not able to carry that mantle as far as he needed to carry it because he did not take care of love the Lord thy God with thy body. So he was destroying his physical body. His spirit was quickened and made alive every day. I mean, he was ready. On the inside, he was fired up. His spirit was ready. His soul was even willing. His soul was even willing. In his soul, you know he wanted to give more and to do more. So his soul was on track. But he messed up on the physical man. And the physical man was so out of shape that he could not fulfill what was in his spirit and his soul that God was calling to be released. So therefore, he had to shut down the service so he can go home and get him some rest. Come on, somebody. You know I'm speaking the truth. It's a two-edged sword. I'm telling you, it's a two-edged sword. That's when in the early years, I would train the young ministers. I would train them. When you go out to preach, I said, listen to me. You go. And I say it to, to, to different ones. I said, don't you ever, ever feel embarrassed about you sleeping in or taking a nice long nap before that service that night. You study, you be prepared, because that's your job. You study the word, you be prepared with the message, and then you better get in there and get you some sleep. Don't do like these, all these pastors want you to do like they, like they want me to do. They want me to run all day with them. They want me to go do hospital visitations. They want me to do nursing home visitations. They want me to do home visitations. They want to drag me all over the neighborhood and wear me out all day long and then expect me to get up there and minister to their entire congregation and prophesy over every individual, even if there's 500 people there. Well, of course, that's been done more than once. I don't do that. I said, you make sure that you let them know that you, you, got, to get, you got to be prepared for the evening. You need to sanctify, separate yourself unto the Lord because you want to hear what God has to say to their church. He can get his elders and other people to go do the running around. Huh? Yes, but because God, number one, and when you come there, if you minister to that entire congregation, you have blessed his entire church and you minister to him privately, minister to him a one on one in his office. Give him personal ministry or her personal ministry. Make sure you minister to them. Make sure you do spend that quality time with them the day before. That's why I always went in before. I always went in before so they can wear me out all day for one day. And then after that day, revival would start, then I could be back in the word of God and I could meditate on the Lord. And I could, because I want to be spirit, soul, mind and body. I want to make sure that I'm congruent. I want everything flowing, spirit, soul, mind and body. And when the Holy Spirit whispers move, I want my body to be able to move. And when the Holy Ghost says go this way, I want to be able to go that way. I want to be able to obey. I want to be able to be submissive. I want to be able to allow the Holy Spirit to guide me in any direction. Speak a word here, prophesy a word there, lay hands here, word of knowledge there. You see? Well, I'm not going to get that if that man wears me out. 
I'm not going to get it as, as, as effectively because I'd be like the other one. I would be like, well, I think that's about it for today. <laughs> Woo. That's about it for today. I think God's saying that's enough. You know, <laughs> the reason why God's saying that's enough is because God's saying, if you don't fix yourself, you're going to fall out. So, yeah, I'm saying that's enough. But the reason I'm saying it's enough is because you, you haven't taken care of the temple. Inside's good. It's nice and sharp and ready. But the outside. So for some of you, this means a lot to you. Because you want to make sure you fulfill the call in the race. That you go the complete distance. And you be like Morris Cirillo or someone who's 88 years old. He's going to be with the Lord just really recently last week, but 88 years old. <laughs> he wouldn't slow down. I got to be with him in Orlando. And I mean, he just wouldn't slow down. More Cirilla wouldn't slow down. Just wouldn't slow down. My gosh. All right. Let me take you to uh, Matthew chapter 18. And then the last place will be 1 Peter. I'll let you go ahead and get to both places. Matthew 18. And then First Peter. And then I'll close the message. Have you enjoyed so far? I pray you have. Number one thing that you're walking away with today is that God is working on my character. If I spent half the time that I spend trying to work on others, I'm working on myself. See? Sometimes we've got to remind ourselves that. If I just spent half the time working on myself that I'm spending to work on other people, I'd be in a whole lot more better shape. Sometimes that's an honest truth. Now I'm saying I'm preaching and I'm using, remember that's an illustration. I, I, don't, I don't allow myself to be overworked by people because I know people are going to do what people want to do anyhow. So regardless of what I say, they're going to do their own thing. And once you learn that, then you can free yourself from that. If they ask for your opinion, you give it. If they ask for your insight, you share it. If they don't ask for it, then sometimes there's certain people that you just as well just do what I said. Go pray. God can work on them. Don't, don't make yourself so special that you think God can't get to them without you. That's prideful. God's able to get to them without you. Can I get a witness? He got to me without you. You didn't come to me. <laughs> he got to me without you. I'm a witness. My parents took me to church, but it was still the man. Power of God. All right, Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, Jesus replied. How many times, saints? <laughs> Seventy times seven. That's 490 times. That's 490 times. Don't you think that Jesus is basically saying that you ain't going to be able to keep count, so just forget about it and keep forgiving them? Huh? I mean, basically, it doesn't, you, know, you, know, you know nobody's going to be counting. Now, wait a minute now. This, this is 16 this week, okay? Um, and they keep track. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. There, there's, there is some people that do keep track. They write it down, pen and pencil, date and time. They do keep track. Every time you do them wrong, it's written down. They've got it all down and then they can, so they can show it to you one day. See what you did to me? The, right here, first back, right here, 1962. I'd be like, well, wait a minute, I wasn't even born to 64. <laughs> you must have started the list before me. That's somebody else's list. Oh, that's right, that's right, that's right. That's my husband's. This, here, for this password, this one's on you. <laughs> uh, all right, your cruise captain's going to bring it into port in a minute. But anyhow, <laughs> 490 times, that's a lot of times. Just, just forgive people, forgive people, forgive people. Let them go. You'll free yourself. All right, so I want to call this one uh, here out of 1 Peter chapter 3. I want to call this um, deliverance from an unforgiving heart, that you be delivered from, because you want a forgiving heart. So you want to be delivered from an unforgiving heart. I also want to title this particular passage uh, called to, a, to Blessing and Suffering for Righteousness' Sake. So we're called to a blessing. 1 Peter 3 and 8, finally, 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 this is what he says, finally, 
after all the things I've said, finally, this is what Peter says, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, which means retaliating, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were what? You were what? Called. To this you were called? To this you were called? That you may obtain a blessing. All right, let me repeat it. Finally, all of you have unity of the mind, sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart, a tender heart, a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or rivaling for rivaling, but on the contrary, bless for this you were called. You're called to this that you may obtain a blessing. So I'm going to obtain a blessing if I do these things. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For your eyes, for the, the eyes, speaking a lot about eyes, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Isn't that powerful? To this you were called. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate when people say unkind things about you. That's New Living Translation. Don't retaliate when... Remember, vengeance is the Lord's. The vengeance is the Lord's and he shall repay. So therefore, we put them into the hands of God. And we do not retaliate when people speak evil about us. We do not repay evil with evil. It's no longer an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You did me this way, I'm going to do you back that way. No, we are the believers of Christ. We are those that are going to walk in peace when they cuss us, when they come against us as Christians, when they ridicule us, when they despitefully use us, when they say evil things against us. We're the ones that are going to go into the prayer closet and say, Father, bless my enemies. What, what do you mean bless your enemies? Bless them. Bless them with peace. Bless them with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Bless them with salvation. Bless them with wisdom. Bless them with understanding. They don't know what they're doing. They need enlightenment of your word. They need, they need somebody that they'll listen to. Bring somebody into their life that can correct them. Not in an evil way. You're saying it in a good way. Correction comes from the hand of the Lord, too. So you're saying, God, you correct them. I can't correct them, but you can. And maybe God's working on their character. And while he's working on their character, they're watching your character. So they're mirroring your character because you're the Christian and the born again one. And they're not. And if they're not born again, they're going to mimic. They're going to mirror what's reflected from you because they're going to assume that's how Christians act. And since you go to work and you get upset and you cuss everybody out, then it must be acceptable. Cussing Christians ought not be so. <laughs> Cussing Christians ought not be so. Life and death is where the power of the tongue. Blessings and curses. You, you got to make sure you choose on how you're going to use this. Right? Amen. I, I still believe there's such thing as sin in the Bible. Gossiping being one. Gossiping. <laughs> gossiping is one of them. Because when you're slandering your brother or your sister, when you are slandering someone, you are slaughtering them with your tongue. You are destroying their character or the image of that person in the eyes of someone else. Okay, I'll leave this as an example because it happened when Pastor Gene Sherrod first came to the church. When he first came to the church, 
uh, a lady who actually at that particular time, she owned quite a few pieces of property around the corner. And uh, I, I, he was here and I said, you know, we, sh we should put a sign down there on the corner and something that says Lisbon Church of God, you know, this way, because unless you go this way to go home, you don't turn this way, you know, or to go back through the Ocala Forest. So um, he was going to see if he could put a sign up. So he went to this lady and he asked about putting a sign up there on that piece of property. And this was up there. And uh, she was very, she was very nasty, very mean to him and said, absolutely not. I went to that pastor and I asked that pastor for help and he told me no. And she said it in such a nasty way, such a very vicious, mean way, that he hadn't been here very long. He had only been here for a very, very short time. In fact, I don't even think his wife was coming at that time. She actually got saved coming to church here and given her heart. I think, I believe it was G.W. Carroll was ministering. I'm not sure, but it was, she, she, wasn't, going, she wasn't a church goer and he hadn't been in years. And uh, he just did an ultimatum to her. He says, there's only going to be two people living in my house. One pe was something about those that are saved, and that's it. Unsaved. <laughs> he was tough uh, in those early years. And so he finally came to me because he was going to leave the church. He was, he was just going to leave the church because what this lady said. And he didn't really know me. He hadn't been here all that long. And so he says, can I share with you what she said about the sign and not putting it up there? And I said, sure. And he says, well, she, she told me that she came to you and she asked for help and you told her absolutely not. That you was not going to do that. You weren't going to help her. And I said, yeah, that's true. And he was a little bit shocked and then taken back. I said, did she tell you what she was asking of me for? And he said, no, she didn't share that. I said, she wanted me to get my members of the church and turn my fellowship uh, into a phone center for her political candidate. So she wanted to use my members of my church for her political party to make phone calls for a political candidate that she wanted. It wasn't for a president. This was, this was for some, some politician locally. And I said, I, we were just birthing the church. This church was brand new. And I, I said to her, I said, no. I said, that's, that's not what we're called to do. That's not our agenda is to use the members of our church and turn our fellowship hall into a call cell. So that's what I turned her down for. And he's like, really? And I'm like, yeah. So do you see how she, she slaughtered me in the eyes of him? Can you imagine how much effect that had if, he, if, 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 they, if we didn't get that settled? Because you guys know me and him. Do you realize we wouldn't have went to Guyana together? We wouldn't have traveled to Tennessee, to Virginia, to Texas, to all these other places of doing ministry. It's a, it's a possibility he wouldn't be pastoring the church that he's pastoring right now if I wasn't a part of the stepping stone of the plan to get him there. You say, well, he could have got there without you. I don't know. It was me that had to really encourage him uh, to be able to break through to get a license with the Church of God because there's a lot of hoops you got to jump through and there's certain things that they absolutely say no to you right off the bat and he was on the list of an absolute no. So there was some maneuvering that had to be done. There had to be some restructuring. There had to be some meetings and some counseling with the higher courts, if you will, to make sure that he was able to move. I hope he's not watching this. I'm not saying too much. My point is this. Watch your lips. Check your character. Watch your lips. Because you may destroy or slaughter another brother or sister by speaking some, uh, something nasty, negative, and critical to someone, not realizing that God was going to use that person to help that individual. And now they can't help that individual because you done ran them off. This is your cruise captain, and we have now entered the port. 